So, Annabelle, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. And um, I hope to actually um, make those touchstones that um, were mentioned. And in particular, I hope it's it's um, resonant in part with with your initiative uh, there. <clears throat> that is trying to understand how you can take large scale observations, for example, <clears throat> and coherently explain them or theorize about them. And so as we go on, I, um, <clears throat> what I wanna do is try to build a picture that shows where basic ideas in statistical mechanics are relevant to understand geophysical phenomenon. And then those actually connect back to basic issues that we treat in quantum mechanics. Um, I'm not going to argue that we need quantum mechanics to explain um, geophysics, but I am going to show how they connect in a, a theoretical framework. So with the satellite era, which really began in earnest in 1979, we sort of glibly can look up all sorts of information at our fingertips now that is quantitative and um, is used for both modeling and prediction. Here is just from two days ago, the uh, view of the North Pole here from space. And, and this has been, been going on since, as I said, 1979, we can observe very well the ice extent in uh, the polar oceans. And we can do that with high accuracy every day. And, and that is because of the difference in the emissivity in the microwave between ice and, and water. And, and so you see that um, looking down from space, you see the ice edge very, very nicely. Now, for those of you who haven't thought about this, this ice, so-called sea ice, is what forms when the ocean freezes. So it's a very thin vernier, several meters of ice that's sitting on four kilometers of the Arctic Ocean. And, and it waxes and wanes um, seasonally. So we can look down and get the aerial coverage. It's harder actually to get the ice thickness, which is the key thing. We want to know the volume and its evolution. So uh, taking a picture like this, which you can go to the, N um, the NSIDC website and, and get yourself. And historically, it's important to note that no nothing could be extracted quantitatively until one went there. And, and this is, of course, somewhat of a dramatic um, view of the world. That is, you have to go there. It takes work. Um, and uh, Zoo Kriegel here in his book in 1935 makes this dramatic statement that um, you, you, you have to go very far away to study this material and there's no help. <laughs> Um, and so forth, that, that uh, the Lord alone is with man uh, up there in the Arctic. And, and so the, the original study, of course, many of many geophysical phenomena comes from the perspective of exploration and uh, less so from the, the perspective of, of uh, science. Okay. But our problem is really deeply connected between those two areas. And so just to point out an interesting historical development, the, the real first systematic study came because of these two gentlemen, uh, Weiprecht and Vampire. Uh, they organized the so-called 1872 to 1874 Austro-Hungarian North Pole Expedition. Um, well, why did they do that? Because um, Weiprecht was a, uh, Austrian naval captain. And um, if you look at the map, there wasn't a lot of uh, Aust Austrian uh, Navy uh, presence at the time. And so, so to make a name for himself, he organized this expedition and uh, it, it got stuck 
and the ship got stuck in uh, Franz Josef land, but they had the presence of mind to make measurements of, of the ice thickness and the temperature. And they took this information uh, back and presented it in this meeting of the German scientists and physicians. Uh, it's hard to get those two groups together now uh, in, in the present day. And they argued that you need to have a monitoring program of fixed observational stations. At the same time, they approached uh, Stefan, whom you know um, probably mostly from the um, what we now call the Stefan Boltzmann law. He measured it um, experimentally, the power rated by a, a body, and, and his uh, student uh, uh, subsequently derived the proportionality constant written here in modern terms. Um, and that's, of course, what controls the surface temperature of the ice. And, and, and in addition to that, this information that he brought to uh, Stefan, that these two gentlemen brought to Stefan, um, was not explained. That is, they made measurements of temperature as a function of time and thickness. And they uh, proposed that he uh, help them explain it. He promptly sat on the data, which happens. Um, and unfortunately, Vyprek died before the realization of the so-called first international polar year. Uh, the observational um, arm of their uh, proposal, and ten years before the solution written uh, by uh, Stefan. Um, and if you look at the original paper, you see that it's motivated by all these different uh, data, all the, uh, in addition to what was observed by this this original group. And the, this is this, the classical um, moving boundary problem when, where, when you grow ice, um, that you get the root T growth. I'll come back to that. Um, and it comes from taking observations and, in, and, and in interpreting them in um, a mathematical framework. And so now we can find whole books on uh, uh, Stefan problems that have uh, no, make no mention of ice. And they're just simply about moving boundary problems. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic, which began with observations, then interpreted and led to this whole uh, interesting area of moving boundaries. So now if we take the same data, what we notice is that uh, the ice extent plotted here as a function of time um, is an oscillator. Um, every winter there's a maximum, every summer there's a minimum. This uh, dashed line is the, is the great 2012 minimum. Uh, and this blue line here is uh, uh, what we have as of this year. And you can see zero is um, down here. It, it defines the horizontal axis. And, and uh, the $64,000 question, as it were, is uh, does this ever go through zero? Um, that is, do we get to a state where there's only ice in the winter and no ice in the summer? And um, you will, if you if you look this coming fall, you will see all sorts of prognostications about how this data uh, will predict that the ice disappears in 2030 or something like this. Um, it's another talk entirely, but um, uh, we we when we look at the the daily data in terms of um, um, a multifractal, what we find is that the uh, noise on the annual scale is white. And so uh, predictions uh, of this minimum are, um, I would say, specious. But the, it's clear that it's important whether or not we have ice um, all year round or only in the winter. Okay. And the centerpiece of the issue of, of whether the ice vanishes um, in the future has to do with what's called the ice albedo feedback. I just want to provide some perspective here. This is a, um, a view of the ice pack, which has open water, which is the dark region here. Um, it has thin ice, which is gray. And you can see when it's deforming, it's a little less gray. Uh, and then it has perennial ice with snow on it up here, which is uh, rather white. And so the reflectivity in the visible or the albedo um, of this 
uh, thicker ice is around 0.65, 65% reflection, and the water is about 0.2. And, and that's the basic idea of the ice albedo feedback, namely shown here in, in, in a cartoon that you could have multiple states in the ice cover caused by the ice albedo. Namely, if you think about uh, some uh, bifurcation diagram here of uh, here's ice extent as a function of say greenhouse gas forcing, if there's a lot of ice, then there's a lot of reflectivity. Um, but as the, um, the perennial ice uh, decreases and more open water appears, then there's more energy absorbed by the system and eventually there could be a transition from uh, the present state to um, an open water state uh, beyond a certain threshold. Now, practically, uh, from the standpoint of humanity, it's sort of irrelevant whether or not it's a saddle node bifurcation or it's reversible um, because it's a dramatic change. But to understand whether whether it's a saddle node versus a reversible uh, process is really important for us uh, trying to either uh, predict exactly what will happen in the future and or uh, mitigate it. So there are three approaches. Um, solely observationally, there is very low resolution paleoclimate data um, that goes back uh, many millions of years. And I showed you the daily high resolution satellite data over decades. There's a big separation in time scales and therefore um, interpretive context for the observations. <clears throat> there are models, climate models, which you have probably heard of. Those are really, um, let's call them the engineering approach that you put in all the appropriate conservation laws with parameterizations and so forth and make predictions. I'll come back to that. And then there's what I'll call observationally informed uh, theory. So from the perspective of the people who know me, it's not an unsurprising claim that um, I argue that many methods that we use in statistical mechanics and dynamical systems uh, really informs all of these approaches. And uh, we, we uh, take such approaches to um, at least uh, number one and number three, um, but I'm now going to focus on number three and see where that takes us. Now, as a comparison and contrast, um, in terms of the approaches, I want to make a distinction between how we understand the flows of the atmosphere and the ocean and the ice problem. So here's just a loop of the moisture content and at about the tropopause. And, and you can uh, see we're, we're sitting here watching the atmosphere. You see the intertropical convergence zone. You see the jet stream. You see Rossby waves. You see major features in the flow of the atmosphere um, from the comfort of your own home. And we understand these things and we can understand these things by, by going to the laboratory in addition to um, making satellite observations or interpreting satellite data. And one can argue that really geophysical fluid dynamics is a laboratory science in the sense that we can go to the lab and we know the key tools um, and we can make predictions that are seen in the observations. Um, and, and so we can understand the, the, the main features of flows in um, our, the fluids of the earth using this time-honored approach. On the other hand, if we look at the ice pack itself, which is shown here um, in this year, 2012, you look down at the ice pack and you ask yourself, well, is this a fluid? And is it a uh, solid? Is it a granular medium? And what is uh, the aggregate constitutive behavior and so forth? 
And, and so taking the analogous approach to uh, the, the atmospheric dynamics problem, and the question naturally arises, you know, how do I quantify the geophysical scale evolution of the system and translate those observations you know, into um, the, the same laboratory experiment that one could do in geophysical fluid flows? And okay, so that's the, that's the, the question to, that we would like to uh, address or approach. And the answer really is there is no laboratory scale experiment that uh, successfully deals with uh, the key aspects of the system. Okay. However, historically, it's not surprising <clears throat> that um, the continuum treatment of the ice pack comes in the spirit of forecasting. Right? And so writing down the uh, right conservation laws um, is, has been around for a long time. And here, the key issue uh, that I want to focus on is the momentum balance. So, uh, so this is, you know, F equals MA for, for the ice pack. And um, you see all these terms um, on the right-hand side, uh, air stress, wind stress, um, rotation, um, uh, pressure gradient, sea surface tilt. And then you see this red term, uh, the divergence of the stress tensor, okay? So um, if I were just to have the red term, this would be Stokes flow. So if all the black terms were gone, this would just be Stokes flow. However, I need to have a constituent law that relates the stress and the strain rate, okay? For this aggregate. And um, we don't know that. So, you know, what is the dependence of the stress on the thickness and its distribution? We do not know the answer to that. And, and of course, there are lots of uh, approaches. You could put in a constitutive law and solve this equation. This is, of course, um, a key module in climate models. And, but the fact is, we don't know whether the constitutive law is elastic or plastic um, or viscous plastic. And, and on some scale, it's not even a differentiable function. Okay. So the first approaches to this problem, understanding, trying to understand what the constitutive law is, begins from a reductionist approach, right? Um, to uh, try to understand how the large scale emerges from the mechanisms of deformation. And, and Drew Rothrock wrote in 1975 review here. Um, those of you who have a background in fluid mechanics will have heard of Brooke Benjamin. Uh, Drew was a student of Brooke Benjamin um, and was quickly working on this. He says, you know, the simple fact is that we're not at all sure what the constituent equation is. And therefore we've turned to studying ridging, uh, rafting, shearing and opening to deduce uh, what one can for about the large scale mechanical behavior of pack guys. Okay. So that's 1975. Um, some years later, uh, Dominic Vela and I worked out how you could um, explain the major features, deformation features in the ice pack um, using um, the appropriate limits of the Foppel von Karman equations or thin plate theory. And, and so here's the, the dimensionless thickness as a function of the dimensionless strength. And the only point of me uh, point, uh, um, making this, uh, showing you this picture is that um, the, when there is wind stress divergence and the ice deforms, these are the, the only three possibilities of deformation, okay? Nonetheless, having derived uh, this regime diagram, it's not at all clear how you translate this into div dot sigma. That is, what is, what is the constituent law emerging from these basic uh, processes? And so if I stop there and say, well, the approach of writing down the momentum equation um, is still limited by understanding what the constituent law is. And even though we realize the Rothrock scheme all these years later, it's not obvious what to do with this information. 
although um, some of you may have your own ideas there. Okay. Now, the same group of, of scientists at about the same time said, well, <clears throat> we realize that's a problem. Let's take, let's think about it in a different way. Um, and, and this is amongst the most, um, I, I would say, the, the most beautiful papers uh, in geophysical uh, phenomenon that I've seen because it really tries to simplify a complex problem in a rigorous way. The idea here is that, well, let's forget all those particular details how, in terms of how they evolve, whether you have simple rafting or ridging um, in the ice pack and just recognize that the events themselves occur and change the distribution of the ice thickness. So the, the approach of this paper is to say, let's take a domain, um, or this is my interpretation of the approach uh, in this paper. Let's take a region R in the ice pack, which has many, many, many ice flows and open water and so forth. Okay, and, and, and say that the fraction of that region which has ice between thickness H1 and H2 defines uh, a probability density function G of H. Okay, it's really G of H of T of T, but uh, for, for brevity, I'm just calling it G of H. Okay. Now, how can the distribution change? Okay, What's, what, what, what are the processes that give rise to the change in this distribution? Okay. So you can have uh, the a region receive ice from motion itself, that is advection of ice into and out of a region changes the distribution in that region. So that's intuitive. You can also have the ice growing or melting. And that's this little F here. This is their notation. That's this little F. So that is the thermodynamic, if you will, change in the ice thickness distribution. And then there is the mechanical processes that I referred to uh, previously. That is deformation, rafting, and ridging, and so forth. Now, uh, if you just look at this equation, which is um, written faithful to the original paper, you see that psi, um, which we know is due to mechanical interactions, is not written in terms of G. And, and so this equation is um, not a closed equation. And they pointed out in their um, uh, paper uh, that, you know, if we want to understand thermal and mechanical processes, we, know, we need to understand this, okay? They, this is a quote from their paper. The present theory suffers from a burdensome and arbitrary redistribution function. Um, yeah, it's hard to write this in a paper anymore, um, uh, but they did and, and, and they focused the problem, um, you know, how do we understand this in terms of the distribution and, and the important point here is that the ignorance in the momentum equation in terms of the constitutive law is just translated into the ignorance into this, uh, of this redistribution function itself. Okay, and, and there it's from 75 um, until relatively recently in 2015, that uh, there were lots of attempts to try to understand this redistributor or the redistributor, that, as they called it, um, in various modalities, uh, but never to close this equation. Okay, and and so our thinking was, um, in addition to the general distribution of, of ice thickness, we'd like to understand how that redistribution function for mechanical interactions can be understood. And and that's really in terms of the concepts of Brownian motion. Um, and as you may know, here's a very nice example of Brownian motion, uh, where you have the Brownian particle, which is the, is the white sphere here. Uh, and as the small seeds are being um, excited, 
uh, with oscillations, there are very, very rapid collisions um, between the small particles and large particles. The small particles here are playing the role of water and the large particle is playing the role of a pollen grain. And as you may know, we cannot understand the overall displacement of the large particle if we ignore the collisions between the small particles and the large particle, okay? But we can track the ball because there's a huge separation of time scales. So the distribution itself changes slowly relative to the individual mechanical events which, which deform the ice pack. Those really depend on um, you know, the deformation and the failure that leads to uh, rafting, ridging, et cetera, happens uh, on the timescale of photons in, uh, in the material. So it's very, very fast relative to the change in the overall distribution. And that's the key idea here. Okay. So with that, concept in hand, if we revisit the Thorndike et al. equation um, and treat the redistribution function in terms of transition probabilities, then we can make progress. Okay. So uh, this is exactly uh, what is written here. Um, and the idea is that, is that the distribution changes mechanically when process processes occur such that the thickness goes from one value to another or the other way around. And the difference on these transition probabilities is going to give rise to the overall change um, and that we desire, okay. And this is an exact analogy, uh, if you're familiar with it, to the master equation uh, for probabilities of collisions of solvent molecules with a, with a Brownian particle, okay. Because there we would like to know if I have a, you know, the probability of finding a Brownian particle at this place at this time um, depends on the uh, transitions between one position and the, and the previous position summed over all possible previous uh, positions. So it's really in analogy, in an, in analogy to that, so that we can actually expand uh, the integral or the integrand um, in what's now called the Cromer's Moel expansion. Um, there's a bit of an anal analysis that I could discuss if people are interesting, interested in that associated with the Paulus theorem. But the idea is that uh, we take only the first two terms in the expansion, okay? And and that uh, leaves uh, these two uh, evective and diffusive terms where these uh, Ks are integrals or moments against the, the transition probability, okay? So in, in the case uh, that motivates us, that means that this redistribution function is translated into these two terms an advection and, a, and a, a diffusion term, okay? Where the uh, K1 and the K2 are the first and second moments against these uh, transition probabilities. Now, to make progress, we have to, of course, assume that the transition probabilities themselves, you know, it's the physics of what happens to ice. It doesn't care where it is. Um, it only to care, cares what the forces are. And so um, these, integrals we argue are uh, converged that is the the, the processes um, are independent of geography so now if we if we just stare at this for a moment if you're familiar with um, uh, the fokker planck equation you'll see that that it's a kind of fokker planck equation but not quite it has this this term here um, and now there are these two what are called drift terms we can rewrite this if we move into a Lagrangian frame, okay. So now if I'm moving in this frame, it will, it will be um, a Lagrangian uh, fokker planck equation, okay. Now, if we look for uh, steady solutions with a particular approach to the thermodynamic term, 
uh, we remind you that this F is the growth rate, okay? And we just use the fact that, um, that uh, ice, when it's thin, it grows faster. So here's the temperature gradient across the layer of, of thickness H. And F, this little F is the growth rate, okay? So, um, so for ice, the latent heat is rather large. And, and so the growth rate is now just written here uh, explicitly in terms of F. And so for a linear profile, F is just inversely proportional to H, okay? And that's where the square root of time comes from. But that means I have a solution for the winter when the ice is growing that I can insert into uh, this equation and solve it using just an integrating factor. And so this is uh, the invariant measure for the winter distribution. Um, and, it sh and, and, and it sh has this norm normalization constant, but uh, the important thing is that H, the ice thickness, um, when H is small, these two terms are important. And when ice gets thicker, the only way it can get thicker is by deformation. And that's this exponential uh, tail. Okay, and so we have a bivariate distribution with only two parameters, which is the right way to do things. And I'm just showing you here the satellite observations from uh, ISAT, uh, which is an altimetry measurement of the ice thickness distribution. Um, that's the circles. And the blue line is uh, our theory. Okay. Um, and, and so this was something that we worked out that uh, Shrikov Topoladoti and I worked out in um, at the Woods Hole uh, GFD program in the summer of uh, 2015. Um, and I just want to make the point that um, Ron Kwok, who is the, the master of satellite observations of ice thickness, uh, was uh, at, at JPL for most of his career. He uh, said, Yes, well, we were wondering, you know, why is it that this is the best fitting function? Um, and, and of course, now we have a, uh, we, we've derived it from first principles, and it shows why that's the case. When the ice is thin, both uh, growth and decay and me me mechanical deformation give rise to the change in the ice thickness. And the only way the ice can get really thick is due to mechanical uh, processes. So uh, th this is the, is the uh, principal first result of uh, taking just a simple PDE um, and comparing it to the observations, okay? Now, you may or may not know uh, that to every uh, Fokker-Planck equation, there is a Langevin equation. So Langevin was the first one to try to understand Brownian motion by beginning with the equation of motion for the particle rather than the probability of finding a particle in a position uh, at a given time. So the duality for us is between this equation and its associated Langevin equation, okay? And so now this is the evolution of the thickness field, okay? And um, at just a note that there is uh, this term here, which is a, a repeller of the origin, that is that, um, that there is an equilibrium ice thickness or mean ice thickness, okay? And this term here is a, is a, um, a stochastic term. This is uh, uh, white noise, okay? So that allows us to use the duality, the fokker planck langevin equation in duality to then study the thickness evolution. And so uh, that also can be done, um, if you will, on the back of, a, of, a, of the, an envelope or with a, um, a laptop um, where uh, one can produce many, many realizations uh, of the thickness field um, and get converged statistics, um, which is now shown here. So this is the same data, but we're talking now about uh, the Langevin equation, okay? And so um, for those of you who study these things, 
it's a bit of a tautology, um, but it's a test. That is, the tautology is that we don't expect that if the Fokker Planck equation reproduces the observations, that the Langevin equation wouldn't do that. <clears throat> but the uh, comparison provides us with uh, a key consequence that is, that it shows us that there's a space time ergodicity of the ice thickness field. Namely, um, we're looking at the invariant measure over the entire ice pack. This is, these are observations that are over thousands of kilometers. Um, and so if we look at it at one time, it's going to give us uh, the spatial distribution of the, of the um, ice thickness. Okay. Moreover, we have a single uh, PDE SDE pair, uh, the Fokker Planck Langevin pair, that we can use to do climatology. And uh, we don't need a climate model per se. Okay. Okay, so we can generalize this and use a more complex climatology for the growth rate, um, which is um, a column model. Um, a forced column model with an atmosphere, um, a gray body, two stream atmosphere, uh, which Ian Eisenman and I uh, developed also at GFD in the summer, uh, way back in uh, the summer of 2006 that we uh, developed. Um, and you can use that and numerically solve for the distribution. <clears throat> and as you know, if I know the, the PDF, I can compute all the moments. And this is just. Uh, so these are just some examples. The mean thickness, the seasonal cycle of the mean thickness as uh, greenhouse gas forcing increases, mean thickness decreases, as you would expect. And you can see the distribution being driven um, in the red curve that high greenhouse gas forcing driven into the origin uh, itself. And, and I'll also point out that the ice um, thickness distribution process is key in maintaining the ice pack longer than it otherwise would be if you were just treating the thermodynamic growth. Namely, when the ice gets thin enough, it will deform. That deformation makes it thicker. <clears throat> the albedo uh, goes up. And, and so it saves the ice, if you will. Okay. And so here, just as an example, what we might expect in the future what we see is that is the fraction of open water <clears throat> increases uh, as the greenhouse gas forcing increases, as you would expect, <clears throat> but shown here quantitatively. And that changes the timing of uh, seasonal uh, transitions. <clears throat> and I, I could show uh, many other plots, but I think the main point here <clears throat> is that these um, overall large scale features are easily captured in a framework, which is really a back of the envelope uh, framework. Okay, so the timing of transition. So I showed you at the beginning, right? This oscillation, seasonal oscillation. Um, and one would like to know, of course, when there might be a zero um, and one can, uh, understand where this comes from using a fundamental uh, approach. Okay, so I mentioned something about uh, uh, quantum statistical geophysics. So what did I mean? Um, now, what I've done here in the top line is to rewrite in a little bit more generic form <clears throat> the same um, structure of the Fokker Planck equation that we've just been studying. Okay, so rho is G, um, but I write it as rho just to make sure that uh, I'm explaining to you that um, this is the, is the main structure of our Fokker Planck equation, but there are these two parameters A and B. And in this field, there are uh, there's a so-called Rayleigh process and there's a so-called Bessel process. And that is whether you have just this term or just this term, okay? Now, in this 
problem we've been studying, they're both present. And, and so um, if you um, want to write this in terms of potential, um, whose derivative is the force here, then it's this logarithmic potential with a constant offset. And we call this a, a, the climate potential. So uh, such a Fokker-Planck equation can also be studied using spectral methods. Um, and, and there we can write a stationary solution in terms of this, uh, this potential. Okay, so now um, when we do that, um, it's a Stern-Louisville problem. And what we find is that this really is an imaginary time Schrodinger equation with this, this potential, okay? So um, directly from the generic structure of our uh, climate problem, we arrive um, uh, to uh, an imaginary time Schrodinger equation, okay? And interestingly, depending on uh, the sign of our parameters and the relative size of those with respect to the noise amplitude, which is the sigma, okay? Uh, that sigma in this case is playing the role of h bar. Um, we get all the processes that we see in, in quantum mechanics. That is, here's the potential as a function of position. Uh, we either get the complete discrete case, we get um, the continuous case where we get the mixed uh, continuous and discrete states that we see in quantum phenomena. Um, and, 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 and the problem uh, theoretically here is that when you have uh, the mixed uh, discrete continuous states normalizing uh, potential uh, off to infinity is a, is a challenge. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we have a framework that is in direct analogy to um, what we uh, understand from uh, quantum phenomena. So one might say, if you want to understand quantum phenomena, you should study uh, uh, classical phenomena or climate uh, dynamics. Okay. So the two main uh, points I want to uh, come uh, leave you with are that um, there are stochastic successes um, in this approach that, that I have focused on principally, that is using um, basic concepts from statistical physics. We've been able to de develop uh, a, a closed theory for the evolution of the sea ice thickness distribution. Um, and we took that um, and tested it on the largest observational scales. Um, and having done that, um, I think we, we have a, a very convincing framework that was originally envisioned in 1975 by Thorndike et al. Uh, that is easily insertable into uh, a climate model module rather than taking uh, the momentum equation approach. Now, I only hinted at um, both uh, the, the elastic, elastic successes and failures that is, I uh, very briefly mentioned in terms of the regime diagram uh, of Dominic and myself, that we could use thin plate theory to explain the main deformation features um, in the ice pack, but um, it's still not clear what we would do um, with that information if we wanted to make a rheology um, of the ice pack. And so that's still, I would say, an elastic failure and may or may not be uh, something uh, people are interested in pursuing, um, but the groundwork is laid for that, okay? So I, I want to acknowledge um, uh, collaborators here. The main uh, driving force in this um, direction was uh, Srikanth Topoladoti, which is a part of his PhD thesis only a part of a great PhD thesis um, and its ongoing work. Um, the spectral approach uh, was worked out with Filippo and Wusak Moon. Um, and the uh, stuff I touched on in terms of deformation was started also at GFT with, with Dominic uh, Vela. And there's plenty of um, um, cures for uh, insomnia that have 
emerge from this work. Um, and I just uh, want to make a final point by quoting uh, Charles Frank, who uh, noted on him point of his retirement that physics is not concerning just concerning the natures of things, but concerning the interconnectedness of all the natures of things. And I think he was just pointing out that um, that uh, emergent phenomenon are as interest as interesting as reductionist uh, phenomena, and it's not always the case that taking the reductionist approach uh, leads to successes. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Watlaufer. Uh, we can have a few questions. So I already see, uh, so those who wish to ask questions, you could either ask directly or type in the chat box. So the first question, which is already there, uh, is from Professor Devashi Sengupta from Indian Institute of Science. What mechanical processes thicken sea ice? Right. So, um, so what 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 thicken sea ice? Um, let me just see. So, if if you have, so here are two ice sheets floating. Okay, uh, and so just like uh, sheets of paper on a desk, if you push them together, um, the the first mode uh, where it will bend up. Um, will lead to a failure, okay? So I, I um, can imagine there being a failure at the maximum that makes two sheets from one, okay? And as they continue to be forced together by the wind stress or the water stress, then several things can happen. One is that one goes over the other or vice versa, just like sheets of paper on a desk, okay? Now, as the ice gets thicker and thicker and thicker, that doesn't happen. Um, and it's like books on a desk. Then, then, then the books pile up on each other. Um, and so those are the, that's, that's ridging. And the first is simple rafting. And, and we can actually produce how the failure works. And then we can understand how the rafting works. When it's very thin, um, then there's a special kind of rafting in which um, there is an instability that's transverse and that gives fingers, uh, that's called finger rafting. It's a bit esoteric, but sort of amusing from a, just a basic science standpoint that you could get such a, a pattern. And we can re reproduce all those by beginning with uh, Foppel von Kármán equations, uh, symmetrized and then asking about the failure of the system. So simple rafting, ridging, and finger rafting. Uh, those three processes change the ice thickness mechanically. And they happen very quickly, right? I mean, if you simply break something, it happens uh, very, very rapidly relative to the overall deformation. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? So uh, while we wait for others, uh, I'll just add a few questions regarding the, when you have this formulation of a Boltzmann-like equation, are you uh, inherently assuming something about the nature of interaction between the flows? I mean, is it like they are assumed to only be a binary kind of an interaction? Right, so um, yeah, okay. So number one, uh, first assumption along those regards is that as you recall, I'm integrating over transition probabilities, right? right. <clears throat> so it's the difference between the probability of something going from thin to thick minus thick to thin. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and so the principal assumption there is that the transition probability, <clears throat> that is the physics of how things break <coughs> is, is uniform everywhere, okay? <coughs> so it doesn't matter where the ice is. If there's a forcing on it, it breaks, okay? Um, and that transition um, is the same everywhere. A consequence of that is that when we do the um, Cromer's uh, expansion, <coughs> 
okay, inside that integral, um, that that the moments, okay, against those two prob transition probabilities are constant. Namely, uh, that's just a consequence of saying that how the breaking occurs is uniform everywhere uh, in the domain. Um, and so, so I had those K1s and K2s ultimately, right? Um, and, and those are assumed to be constant. And then, of course, the check of that is the comparison between the predictions and the observations. Um, uh, that will break down. Where will it break down? It will break down where you go to the edge of the ice pack, right? Where, where the ice is abutting the open ocean. Um, that, that will certainly break down uh, there. Um, so we can think about it as, a, as the Petri dish, right? So I can only look at the Brownian particle inside the Petri dish. Uh, I don't care about the probability of finding the particle outside of it. Okay. Um, and the analogy to Brownian motion is that each collision um, with, um, of a water molecule with a pollen grain um, is independent of each, every other uh, collision. Thank you. Uh, so just along that same line, when you had this advection term and you move to a frame of reference to actually finally not having to deal with it, I'm assuming you are considering a uniform background advection. Uh, that's this is a good question. Um, so there was a tiny little um, footnote there. I'm just going back to it. Um, worth worth. Uh, maybe I'll share it again. Um, here it is. <clears throat> okay. So maybe I should even go uh, to the previous. Okay. So, <clears throat> so right here. Um, okay. So if I expand this out, I think that this is this is your point. Um, if I expand out uh, div dot uh, u g. Okay. Then I'm going to have two terms, okay, um, and one will be the diver the divergence of the velocity field. So the other is absorbed into the material derivative, right? Right. Okay. And so now the remaining term is g times div dot u. Okay. And Sahil and I analyzed thirty years of ice velocity data. Now, where does that come from? Um, for 30 years, or actually longer, um, people have been deploying um, buoys on the surface of the ice pack. They measure the pressure and they measure the position, okay? Uh, the pressure gives you the, the forcing because it's geostrophic. So if you know the pressure, you know the velocity field. And you also know the position independently from GPS. Okay, so we analyzed that and we found that um, the, the velocity field is solenoidal, okay, to one part in 10 to the 12, okay? Okay, so it's, so div dot u is zero. All right, so long as you're in the Petri dish, as you will, okay? Um, and, and so that allows us to, to write uh, the, to, to go to the Lagrangian frame and, and, and know that the velocity field is solenoidal. Okay. Okay. So no, no, no stone unturned. Okay. Uh, um, and then these two terms of so the, the back to your question, K1 and K2 are assumed constant now. Okay. Um, and now I can combine these two terms, which makes this quite an interesting Fokker Planck like equation because there's the sign in there. Um, and, and, and then, so there, there is this ratio, that's the decay length, that's the ratio of those two guys. And then, and then K2 comes into, uh, this exponent, um, and, and that, and that gives us the two parameters for the bi bivariate data. Okay. And then you can analyze the, you can analyze the thickness field in various regions and you find, you know, that these numbers are the same. 
Any other questions? Hello, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Karna. Yeah, so I just was wondering how did he get the one over h term in the uh, Langevin equation? Ah, uh, the one over h term, uh, it comes from uh, this term. Okay, because f is one over h. Here it is. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, so it does a direct mapping from the uh, from the focal plank to the Langevin in the Lagrangian frame. Yeah, uh, and and so so the so the right in, in this general uh, duality, right? The drift term um, is the deterministic backbone of the of the Langevin equation. Okay, so the one over h term comes from this one, and the other term. In, in, in that deterministic backbone comes from, from this term. They always come from the drift term, right? Okay, okay, okay. I see what you mean, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. And so, yeah, so, so we look at that. So that's this term, mm -hmm. right? That K1 is from the other, is the other advection term, the drift term. And then you're always left with, uh, with uh, the, the diffusive term comes from the stochastic uh, part of the, of the Langevin equation. Okay, okay. Yep. yep. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, and if you're interested, right, uh, in the summer 2015, uh, the, if you look at the GFD uh, summer school, uh, um, uh, Charlie Doring gave uh, uh, the first week of lectures, and there's a beautiful set of notes where uh, you can see the, the recipe which takes every Fokker-Planck equation into every Langevin equation, okay? And then in that, in those lecture notes uh, from 2015, you'll also see uh, the difference between uh, stochastic calculi. Um, so the way in which we think about uh, Stratonovich versus Ito calculus, um, <clears throat> th those two things are compared and contrasted here. Um, we we um, make uh, heavy use of this uh, basic framework, but there's very nice uh, pedagogical uh, treatment in those lecture notes. Just advertising for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Complaints? Shouldn't there be some complaints? <laughs> So when you had this uh, conservation of uh, momentum equation in the beginning, and you spoke about this uh, issue with these, uh, the divergence of the stress. So now that you have this prescription of uh, the PDF and finding the moments, will that close the story and you can write down a complete equation for the evolution? No, no. So, um, okay, there, there's several approaches, right? So, so we know now psi which is the redistribution function. And that leads to these two terms here and closes that uh, approach. So, so then I would say that this, this is all I need, right? Because um, I'm predicting the ice thickness distribution. That's what I want. If you take the momentum equation approach, okay? And then, right, you, 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 you're for putting in all these terms, okay? You're, you're making up something for a constitutive law, right? And then you're going to produce the velocity field. Um, then you're going to produce some categories of ice thickness, which you're going to then maybe analyze in terms of a distribution, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a consequence of that approach. And it turns out, you know, for, okay, uh, I guess everyone has their their favorite rheology, um, but you know, different rheologies put into these modules that go into climate models sometimes get the ice to go the wrong way, <laughs> you know, um, and and so that constitutive law, you know, uh, the 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 relation between the stress and strain rate is a, a huge bugaboo, right? Um, and I would just say, forget about it. Right, it's it's these two terms, um, and and you should take a statistical mechanical point of view, and and put in uh, in a discrete form, you know, this into a model, 
uh, rather than solving the momentum equation. But you know, there's inertia, uh, excuse the pun, uh, in in that approach because it comes from forecasting. Um, but it really is, you know, it's the forward problem. You would say, well, here's a constitutive law. Here are the consequences. Here's a constitutive law. Here's the consequences. And and no one can derive that law, right? Um, or at least, well, no one. I can. Um, I can derive the mechanical deformation features in a very fundamental way, but I still can't derive the constitutive law, right? And so let's say I could. Okay, if I could, then at least I would have um, a comparison principle that was rigorous, okay? Um, I can't derive the constitutive law um, in the inverse way, right? I can't, I can't go backwards from these two and give you a constitutive law because this is in probability space, okay? So I can't do it, but maybe someone who's clever can. Uh, anyone else, uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, once again, thank you, Professor Wittlaufer. This was a fantastic talk. We got introduced to a completely new area and uh, a very different way of looking at it. So uh, thank you once again. My pleasure and uh, thanks a lot for your attention and for your questions. Um, have a good trip to Woods Hole. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs>